D.C. city-state, the obelisk, known as the Washington Monument, was dedicated to Freemason George Washington by the Freemason Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia. The secretive brotherhood of Freemasons laid the Washington obelisk's cornerstone in 1848 and contributed 22 Masonic memorial stones. 250 Masonic lodges financed the Washington Monument obelisk, including the Knights Templar Masonic Order. At the heart of London city-state is a 187-ton, 69-foot-tall Egyptian obelisk called Cleopatra's Needle. It was transported from Egypt and erected on the banks of the River Thames. In Vatican City, another Egyptian obelisk towers high above St. Peter's Square. What exactly is an obelisk? Obelisks are phallic-shaped monuments honoring the pagan sun god of ancient Egypt called Amun-Ra. The spirit of this pagan god is said to reside within the obelisk. Obelisks symbolize the phallus and fertility. At the base of the obelisk is a sunwheel circle symbolizing the vagina. Together, they depict male and female sexual union. Worshippers of Amun believe Amun is the supreme god and creator of all things and can transform himself into other gods like Osiris, the god of the underworld, or Seth, the god of evil and chaos. Since vowels were interchangeable in the biblical Hebrew language, Amun can be spelled A-M-E-N, A-M-O-N, O-M-O-N, or A-M-U-N. Today, Amun is one of the most popularly used words in the entire world. It is used in all languages by Christians, Muslims, Hindus, and Jews at the end of prayer. Without realizing it, people all over the world are praising Amun. The Old Test Amen of the Bible is the holy book of both Christians and Jews. Amun is repeated over and over again throughout the Bible and is hidden within the word Test Amen. The word Amun literally means the hidden one. Many are fooled into believing that Amun means so be it or truly, but in Kings 1 verse 36 of the Old Testament, Amun is identified as the Lord God of my Lord. Why in the world would the Vatican, a fortress of Puritan Christian values, erect a monument symbolizing the pagan god Amun and sexual intercourse right in its own front yard? Bloodshed between the Israeli Jews and the Palestinian Muslims is routinely reported by the Western news media. But how much does the general public really know about what's going on in Israel? And why should they even care? Why? Because Israel has written human history and it is also writing the future of humanity. It is important to know that the land now called Israel was originally called Canaan in ancient times. Canaan was populated by the Canaanite people who were the ancestors of today's Palestinians imprisoned in refugee camps in Israel. About 3,500 years ago, the Semitic Hyksos kings ruled Egypt for 100 years, but were expelled from Egypt into Canaan. The Egyptians called these Hyksos people the Habarus, which means Hebrews. These expelled Hebrews invaded and conquered the land of Canaan and changed the name of the land from Canaan to Israel.
135 AD, the name was once again changed to Palestine after the Romans conquered the land. As recently as 1948, the name was officially changed back to Israel again by the Hebrew Zionists, who slaughtered and drove the Palestinian people from their homes, land and villages after World War II. understand what's really going on in the world today is to journey back in time and dig up the ancient secrets of the past. Those ancient secrets have been hidden by the ruling class beneath the shifting sands of Egypt for more than 4,000 years. Historian travel guides like Josephus, Herodotus, and Manetho, as well as writers like David Roll, Ralph Ellis, and Niels Peter Lemke, provide flashlights into the past. The earliest remains of human life on Earth were discovered in Africa. The ancient Egyptians kept detailed records of their culture and history in tombs, in temples, and on pottery, using pictures and writings called hieroglyphics. Archaeology experts have found absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Hebrew Jews lived as slaves in Egypt or of their exodus from Egypt. The plain truth is that Moses didn't lead Hebrew slaves out of Egypt any more than Charlton Heston did. So who was that bearded man with a magical staff named Moses? <laughs> not one shred of archaeological evidence for the existence of Moses or of any of the Bible's main cast of Hebrew characters, from Abraham to Jacob to Joseph to King David to King Solomon. There is, however, plenty of evidence for the existence of Egyptian pharaohs who these biblical characters are based on. The Bible's Old Testament has carefully covered up the connection between the Egyptian pharaohs and the Hebrew patriarchs by mixing up historical facts with myths and legends. The job of archaeology experts and historians is to separate fact from fiction. Modern archaeologists have confirmed that the Hebrews were not a race of people as once thought. They were a Semitic and Asiatic class of foreign workers who migrated into Egypt from neighboring lands in search of work as craftsmen and builders. As their population multiplied over hundreds of years, they contributed to Egyptian technology worshipped Egyptian gods, intermarried with Egyptian nobility, and gradually rose to positions of power and wealth in Egypt. The Bible story of the Hebrew Jews begins with Abram, who was born north of Canaan in the town of Ur around 2055 BC. Abram married his beautiful sister Sarai. At God's command, the incestuous couple changed their names to the Egyptian names of Abraham and Sarah and migrated to Egypt. Once in Egypt, Abraham turned his sister wife Sarah over to the Pharaoh as his harem sex slave and was rewarded with gold and silver. Abraham received covenants or promises from God. God promised to make his name great and to make a great nation for him. God also made a circumcision covenant with Abraham, commanding him to mark the flesh of his people and slaves by cutting off the protective foreskin of their penises. Circumcision was a painful barbaric custom that was introduced into Egypt near this same time and has survived to this day. It is the unnecessary mutilation of the genitals of little boys and implies that God made a mistake in design. This mutilation custom has more to do with a mark of Hebrew ownership than with hygiene. In the continuing Bible story, Abraham married an Egyptian woman named Hagar because his sister wife Sarah couldn't conceive. But at age 90, Sarah finally gave birth to a son named Isaac. Following God's order to sacrifice his son, Abraham hogtied Isaac and picked up a knife to kill him. 
Just as Abraham was about to plunge the knife into Isaac, he learned God was only kidding. Who was the ruling pharaoh that the Bible neglects to identify when Abraham and Sarah reached Egypt? His name was Amenemhet I, and he ruled Egypt from 1991 BC to 1962 BC. The name Amenemhet means Amun is the head. Besides Pharaoh Amenemhet and Biblical Abraham living in the same place at the same time, 